All right. We are uh, in a series about encouragement. And uh, today we're going to look at this, this concept of being encouraged because everybody feels insufficient sometime. Right? Yes, sir. We, we all have this sense. Now, th there's two kinds of people in the room today. There are those who feel insufficient all the time. All right. And then there are those who don't feel insufficient enough of the time. And, and, and so, so some of you, you're like, oh, I just can't do anything. I don't feel like I can do it. Others of you, you feel like, yeah, you're going to take on the world. You'll be okay. And then you get overwhelmed. And that next week is for you. It's how to be encouraged when you feel overwhelmed because you took on too much stuff because you didn't feel insufficient enough. You were trusting yourself. That's, that's for you. That's next week. But you can take notes this week for others, okay? Because uh, a lot of people deal with this feeling of insufficiency. And so we're just going to look, we're going to look at the story of Moses in the scriptures. If anybody felt insufficient, not up to the task that God called him to, it was Moses. And I think we're just going to have a fun time looking at scripture this morning. Let's pray. And then we'll just d kind of dive right into uh, the book of Exodus. Father, I, I thank you, Lord, that our sufficiency isn't in ourselves, but in you. And that uh, your grace is all sufficient. We praise you for that. But I pray that our hearts would be encouraged this morning. You have called each one here to a specific task. Everyone that you have redeemed, you have redeemed for a specific purpose. And we face different challenges, opportunities, obstacles. And Lord, in our hearts, if we're honest, there's times where we feel very insufficient unable to do the, the task that you've called us to do. And so I pray that we would walk out these back doors this morning feeling confident in you and your sufficiency in our behalf. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses was at the burning bush. Now, uh, DreamWorks has taken a stab at this, and uh, that's the most recent one. They made a, a children's version, and uh, they did a pretty good job. And, and I, some of you remember the Moses movies, you know, with Charlton Heston and things like that. But the burning bush is a significant place, you know, in biblical history. It's just this, this awesome place where God meets with this guy, Moses. And my bet is that every one of you, at some point, some way or another, you've kind of come to a burning bush moment at some point. Some point where God has challenged you to take something on, where God's challenged you to grow or step up and maybe into a position in leadership, and, and you've had or will have a burning bush moment at some point where either God has or God will ask you to take on something that can only be accomplished if he helps you do it. Right. And you want that. This church needs burning bush moments corporately, and we need burning bush moments individually so that we won't just run around and do what we were capable of doing, but we'll do only what, is cap what God was capable of doing. And God brings Moses to this point. And so it, maybe there's a father in here, and you, you know that, that God has called you to lead your family in a specific way or a single parent. God's told you to lead the family in a certain way. And you think, I just, I just don't really feel sufficient. I, I don't feel like I've got what it takes to do what I've got to do. Look how wicked the world is. Look at all the influences on my children. I, I just don't feel like I have what it takes to do that. Maybe a student who you're heading off to college or you're just getting back from college and you're thinking next year I'm going to get it better. And, and man, when I get on campus or we've just graduated a bunch of students here in the last few days at all the, of our various schools and, and now you're going to be going into college and you're like, I'm going to take the gospel there. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to stand strong. And, and then some who have gone before you are saying, oh, it's a lot harder than you think. And, and you're wondering, am I, am I going to be up to the task when it's, when it's my turn to get out there and do this? And some of you are in the workplace and, and before you got there, you were really pumped up, you were fired up, and then you realized once you got there, it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be to take this stand for God and to be this light in the darkness. But God's called you to do it. Nonetheless, you've had the burning bush moment, and you will have more in the future burning bush moments where God calls you to do that which you feel insufficient and incapable of. Perhaps it's even an opportunity to serve right here within the church. And, and you say, well, I just I don't think I can teach that class. I don't think I can lead that ministry. I don't. Listen, we're we're going to have to have people step forward and do some things that they presently feel incapable of doing. And, and you'll be rewarded for it. There's never been a time in my life, and I think many people around the room could echo this, that they stepped out on faith and God pulled the rug out from under them and wasn't there for them. 
and, and that joy of watching God do something in your own life that you knew only God did this. I couldn't have done that. It, it's an abundant, amazing thing. And, and I want that for you. I want it for me. Well, the story of the burning bush doesn't really start there. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit back to, in, into the book of Exodus. And we're going to look at the last verse of Exodus chapter uh, Exodus chapter 2, or Exodus chapter 1, excuse me, and then we're going to go into Exodus chapter 2. The children of Israel had prospered in the land, as you know. Uh, if, if, you're in, if you're familiar with this story, uh, Joseph had gone there. He'd been sold into slavery. He ended up being the second in command of all of Egypt because he had saved the Egyptians. A big famine was coming. God let him know in, ahead of time that there was going to be seven years of plenty before the seven years of famine. And very wisely and sovereignly, God kind of moved him into a position of authority, a position of influence. And he saves all of Egypt. And he's such a capable and gifted leader that essentially Pharaoh takes a vacation and just puts Joseph in charge. Eventually, Joseph's family, a clan of about 70, with Jacob, his father, and his brothers, they, they come into Egypt, and, and now here they are, this ragtag family, but Pharaoh says, man, you guys are welcome, come on in, we need more people like you. But then about a few hundred years go by, and, and, and all the good that Joseph did for the Egyptian culture is now forgotten. And we can kind of identify with this as a church, can we not? Because there used to be a time and a place where even secular culture appreciated religion. And they said, religion does good for our culture. But now we've, we've, we've crossed a threshold and there's a generation that's growing up that doesn't remember Joseph, doesn't remember the past. And, and they say, we don't want your religion. You keep that in your churches. We don't need that in, in our culture anymore. So we can kind of identify with where these people were. And Pharaoh gives this horrific command because he feels threatened. And he so Pharaoh commanded all his people he thought were his people. Notice God later is going to call them my people. Pharaoh commands all his people saying, Every son who is born to you shall be cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. He's trying to exterminate a whole generation of Jews. He's afraid that they're becoming so numerous that they're going to align with one of their enemies and, and, and overthrow the Egyptians. And the very next verse says, Then a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And you don't usually see those two verses together because there's a chapter break. Well, what's this lady supposed to do? The command is, you've got to throw that baby boy in the river. Your whole family can die if you don't do this. Your, your, your friends, your loved ones, everybody's under this same threat. This is one of the first times that the Jews faced this, and they would face it many other times in human history, as you guys have seen. Well, the scripture tells us that when she saw that the, it was a beautiful child, and isn't every child beautiful, especially in the eyes of a mother, she hid him for three months. C can you imagine? I mean, I I've been there when my children were born, and, and, and when you hear that first cry... And, and, and you're like, oh, that's good. That, you know, we don't want their lungs to be healthy. And you just want them to belt it out. And when this baby boy is born, they're, they're trying to hush him as fast as they can. They don't want anybody to hear. And there's no joy. And they're scared to death. And, and their family is living under a death sentence. And this child's born into a death sentence. And, and so every time, I mean, a lot of you have little kids. And you can imagine for three months, every time that, that kid cries, they're trying to suppress the cries and, and do whatever they can to get the kid to be quiet. And, and finally, Amram, the father, says to Jacob, we've got to do something. I mean, I, I don't know if they dressed him like a little baby girl. I don't know what, you know. But, and I, my idea is that the whole neighborhood probably was in on it. They were probably trying to save as many baby boys as they could. We, we know about Moses, but surely as a community, they were hiding every baby boy they could, every place they knew to hide him. And, and, and when the guards came through and the, uh, the soldiers from the palace, I bet, you know, there was a signal and this guy did this and this guy did this. So they knew, hey, they're coming down your street. Hide the babies, get them quiet. Because they're trying to protect the lives of these precious little babies. She saw that the child was beautiful and she hid him for three months. But finally it got to the point where Amram said, we can't hide him anymore. And, and he's got older, an older brother and sister at least that we, that we know of. And if we don't get, we do something about this, our whole family is going to die. And we've, we've got to think about the lives of these older children. Can you imagine being put in that place? And we've got to do something about this baby because the rest of the family's lives are in jeopardy. 
And when she could do no longer, when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark. And it's the same word in the Hebrew as the ark that Noah built. It's kind of cool. And, and, and she made it out of bulrushes or reeds and she daubed it with asphalt and pitch. In other words, she waterproofs this basket. With what limited resources she has in a slave household, she fashions the very best protective floatable basket that she can. She put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And you can imagine the scene is, as Jochebed and Amram are standing there and, and Amram says, listen, we've got to get away from here. People are going to know that our baby's in the water if we stand here and watch it. And so they have the daughter go out and just kind of hang out near the river bank. Don't let it out of your sight, I'm sure is what the mother said. Just don't let that thing out of your sight. And, and my guess is that maybe she did sort of strategically place this where he could be discovered by someone who might have mercy. We don't know. That part of the story is not revealed to us. But I mean, come on, a loving mother. I know in the, in the DreamWorks version, they, they shove the thing out in the water and there's rapids and alligators snapping at it. And I'm like, come on, a loving mother that, that hid this baby for three months is not shoving this thing out into the rapids with alligators snapping at it. She puts it in the reeds where the river current can't carry it away. Technically, she's obeying Pharaoh's command, is she not? I mean, some of you have got kids and, and they're just like Jochebed and they're like, I obeyed. You said put the babies in the water and I did. And maybe she's just hoping that somebody will see that she was at least some way obedient and maybe somebody from the palace would have mercy. We just, we just don't know. But the sister stood afar off to know what would be done. And then the daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe in the river and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid over to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. She figured it out. She knew what was going on. Surely everybody in Egypt around there knew that people were trying to hide babies. Come on. I mean, this wasn't a big surprise. Then the sister pops out from behind a bush or some reeds and she says, uh, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the child away and nurse him for me and I will give you wages. She's paying this, this baby's mom to raise her own baby. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And I, I just got to believe here that, that there's a little wink in Pharaoh's daughter's eye. She knows what's going on. Could, could a mother hide her joy at getting her child back? I mean, you kind of feel like she knew what was going on. I don't think this was a big sneaky surprise or anything. Verse 10 says, the child grew. Some scholars say he might have been up to 12 years old by the time they had to give him back. Might have been five, might have been 12, somewhere in that range, probably five years old to 12 years old. And don't you think that Amram and Jochebed, since they knew there was such a tight deadline, poured every single thing they had? Yeah. I mean, they had to teach that child every bit of truth. Yeah. There couldn't be a moment wasted because he was going to be going away to Pharaoh's house and they knew he would learn about all the gods of Egypt and all of, all of, all of the Egyptian and secular learning. And so they just had this little narrow window and they took it really seriously. It's evidenced by the rest of Moses' life that they took it seriously because Hebrews says that when he became old, he didn't identify with, with the household of Pharaoh. He identified with the people of God, even though they were slaves. I mean, I've got kids and I think, how much have I poured into them by age 12. I feel like we're kind of getting lax in our culture and, and we're letting people stay adolescent till they're about 32. You know? And, and we're not taking it seriously that it's a limited time that we have to pour into them. And I don't want to say this, everything that that mom and dad had within their power they did to protect that child and prepare that child for when that child had to go to Egypt. And every one of your children, every one of my children has got to spend some time in Egypt. And we have to do every single thing within our power to protect them and prepare them. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and he looked at their burdens. And don't you think that, that Moses kind of felt almost guilty? Here he is living this privileged life in the palace and he knows he's a Hebrew. His name means I took him out of the water. He was old enough to at least understand some things when he went to the palace. And, and he looks and it's unjust 
Look at the burdens my people are carrying. I could be out there carrying bricks, but I get this life of ease and luxury, and they're out there carrying bricks. One day he's had enough, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren, so he looked this way and that. When he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. That didn't end his problems, and that didn't bring him into a coronation. The Jews weren't ready to, to just go follow him just yet. I don't know if Moses' parents had told him, you're going to be a deliverer. I don't know what was revealed because it doesn't say anything yet in the story. I don't know if he would have had any hint to know. He knew that God spared his life for something. When he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? And he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptians? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And, and those words, who made you a judge over us, were going to haunt him for the next 40 years of his life. Just a little sentence would haunt him. It was known. That dead Egyptian in the sand, that part of his past, it, it was known. And it haunted him. When Pharaoh heard of the matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Moses was about 40 at this time, and as far as he knew, life was over. He had had the best education you could get. He had had all of the opportunities in the world set before him. The, the table of life had been set for him, and he squandered it in an afternoon, in an act of rage, in an act of murder. And now he had a death sentence on him. And, and as far as he knew, because Moses didn't know about the burning bush. He didn't know about the Ten Commandments. He didn't know about any. All he knew was, I had the greatest opportunity in the world and I blew it. I messed it up and now I'm living as a shepherd. And he spends the next 40 years, 40 years of his life on the backside of the wilderness watching sheep. He didn't know that God was preparing him to lead his people like sheep out of Egypt and into the promised land. He didn't know any of that. He just thought, this is where I'm going to die now a shepherd out here and I'll just make the best of it. And that's where we pick up the story. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. Have you ever wondered why God shows up in a bush that doesn't burn? I think God can show up in a lot of ways, and he did show up in a lot of different ways in Scripture. I think God's given Moses a hint right at the very beginning. Watch, Moses. I'm going to harvest glory from this bush, but this bush is not going to be harmed. And I'm going to harvest glory from your life, but you're not going to be harmed. I've got a great task for you to do, but you don't have to worry. You're not going to be harmed. And, and so I think that was a sign for Moses from that day forward. God's going to get glory out of my life, but I'm not going to be harmed. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God said to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. The place where you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, so I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen their oppression with which the Egyptians have oppressed them. And if it stopped there, I think Moses would have been like, Yes! Yes! Man, ah, oh, this is such good news. God, you're going to show up. All these people have been suffering. They're carrying bricks. They're, they're getting beat up for it. And you're going to get them out of there. Yeah. I got some family members back there. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Moses, and I will send you to Pharaoh. That you may bring, whose people? Not Pharaoh's people. My people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. 
Oh, hold on. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Come out. Right? If it was the NFL, we'd be throwing that little flag out. We need to go back to the replay here, God. I mean, I know it's been a long time. I've been out here for at least 40 years, but do you remember 40 years ago? And that's exactly what Moses goes into. Look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Hey, there's still a warrant for my arrest back there. If I go back there, they're going to kill me because I killed somebody. I'm a murderer back there. I've got this, this blemish on my past back there in Egypt. And who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring the children of Israel out? So God says, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign unto you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, God is so confident in what he is going to do through Moses. Not because Moses is great, because God is great. This will be a sign. You will come out here and serve God on this mountain. Hey, in a, in a couple of years or months, you're going to be right back here with a bunch of people. And you're going to worship me on this place and then you'll remember what I said. God gives him a promise. God gives him a future. But Moses still offers some more excuses. And we're going to see, he offers five objections and then and God shoots each one of them down. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? I mean, they've probably gotten into idol worship, all kinds of stuff. And, and, and okay, so even if I go do this, they're going to say, Well, who, who sent you? Who? Well, God answers. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. And God proceeds for the rest of that chapter to give some promises. I'm going to get the people out. Pharaoh's not going to listen. You're going to take a bunch of their stuff on the way out. I'm going to bless you as you leave. And it's going to be great. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses isn't done objecting yet. Even though he's got promises from God. Even though he has a promise of God's presence, he still feels insufficient for the task. And Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. You're an old crazy man, Moses. Coming back 80 years old telling us you saw a burning bush that didn't burn out in the middle of the desert in Midian and you want us to follow you? Why should we risk following you? Isn't it interesting that it says of our Lord, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Who was one of the witnesses on the Mount of Transfiguration? Ah, oh, this guy. He knew what it was like to come unto His own, and His own not received Him. Incidentally, if you want to look for Jesus in the story, Moses comes riding back on a donkey. Behold, your king comes to you riding on a donkey, your deliverer. A lot of cool pictures of, of, of Jesus in the life of Moses. The Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? And he said, a rod. He said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it as you would have. Right? I don't think this was a garter snake. I think it was something nasty with big teeth. Maybe a hooded cobra. He cast it on the ground and became a snake and he fled from it. And then the Lord said, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. <laughs> and he reached out his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand and he breathed a massive sigh of relief <laughs> that they may believe that the Lord the God of their fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you furthermore the Lord said to him now put your hand in your bosom or in your cloak here and he put his hand into his bosom and, and he took it out and behold it was leprous like snow it turned white and he said, now put it back into your bosom again. And he put it back into his bosom again and he drew it out. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. And again, I think he breathed a massive sigh of relief. Then it will be if they do not believe you or hear the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not even believe these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river, the Nile River, and you will pour it on the dry land and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. That gives him three signs to give. And, and you would think that would be enough, right? Wouldn't that be enough for you? Eh, it probably wouldn't be. All right? Because the scripture says that these Old Testament heroes, they were people just like us with like passions and like fears. And Moses said, Oh Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. 
Now, this might be that he literally had some type of a speech impediment that made it difficult. Maybe he had to very slowly think through what he was going to say before he spoke. It may be that he's saying, God, I don't even remember how to speak Egyptian anymore. It's been 40 years. I'm 80 years old. I don't remember that life. Who am I to go stand before the most powerful man in the world and tell him something? Now, now in the rabbinical tradition, this is a dialogue that's happening over seven days, and we're now at day seven. And so that's what we think it means when it says, uh, either before, uh, since you have spoken to your servant uh, before or, or later. So the Lord said unto him, Who made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have I not the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you will say. And yet he still has one more objection. But he said, Oh my Lord, please, sin by the hand of whomever else you may sin. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be as your spokesperson to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth to you, and you shall be to him as God. In other words, you'll speak to me for Aaron, and he'll speak for, for, for me to the people. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. And we know the end of the story now. Moses goes back, let my people go, plagues, awesome stuff happens, right? And they get to come out and they get to the Red Sea and the thing divides. We, we know how it all goes from there. Moses overcomes all of these objections, all of these insufficiencies. But the five objections or, or that were rooted in inefficiency that we see this morning in this story are as follows. Number one, and, and you have a burning bush moment, and these might be the same things you're offering to God. This is why, God, I can't do what you're asking me to do. The first one is this. I've got an embarrassing past that's haunting my present and threatening my future. Oh, oh Jeff, you don't know about the past. You don't know about that dead Egyptian. He's down in the sand somewhere. And, and I don't want anybody to ever find out about that. And if, if I do what God wants me to do, somebody's going to find out about my Egyptian in the sand. I just don't want that to happen. I've hidden it for 40 years. I've run from it for 40 years. I don't want to have to face that thing. You got an embarrassing past. A mistake, a, a, a sin, something back there. The second thing is this, maybe you're saying, but I, I just don't have authority or credibility. No, nobody sees me as, as somebody who has any kind of real authority or credibility. Nobody really listens to me that much. I, I, maybe this one, I lack the influence necessary to succeed. That's one of the things that Moses, I, just, I, I can't influence them. They're just going to say, who sent you? Uh, really, we don't believe you. He, he's projecting upon them disbelief. Maybe I, I have an obvious weakness. I mean, everybody knows it. Moses, for him, it was his slow speech. And I don't know what your obvious weakness is, but, but most of us have something that everybody's aware of that just is not our strength. It's actually a weakness. It's our liability. And, and you're offering up that this morning. You're saying, God, I know we're at the burning bush. I know you're calling me to do fill in the blank, but I have this obvious weakness, so therefore I can't. Or lastly, you might be saying, but, but I'm just not as capable as, as somebody else would be. But we need somebody, somebody else needs to do that. I'm not as good at that as, as that person would be. God, have you considered this? Have you, what about somebody else? But, but see, you're the one at the burning bush. You're the one that God's talking to to do a specific thing. You're, you're the one that has that burden. Somebody else doesn't have it. Regardless of what you think your capabilities or someone else's capabilities might be. So here are God's encouragements to counter our insufficiency. Concerning your past, God is redeeming your past. And he will be with you now and in the future. God's okay with it. He already knows about it. In fact, the, the scripture says, while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. He knew what he was getting. He knew about your past when he was dying on the cross. It was okay. It was, it was worth it for him. The scripture says, he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He knew exactly what he was getting. He knows about your dead Egyptian. He, he gets it. And he's redeeming it. And he wants to continue redeeming that mess 
and turning it into something beautiful in your life. He's redeeming your past and will be with you now and in the future. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you till the end of the age. Concerning your credibility or authority. Oh, I'm just not credible. I just don't have any authority. Well, God's name, when you're doing work in God's name, his name lends credibility and authority. Listen, if I tell you something's right or wrong and it's not from the Bible, does it really have any authority? No. Anybody could get up on this stage and say, this is right, this is wrong. But when we say, God says, what happens all of a sudden? It has authority. It has credibility. And isn't it interesting that when Jesus, right before he commissioned the disciples and said he'd be with them always, the first thing he said is, all what has been given to me, all authority has been given to me, all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now you go. Concerning your ability to influence, I believe this, God always validates his message and his messenger. Truth always stands. He validates his message and his messenger. If God's calling you to do it and you follow him, he validates it. Concerning your weakness, you know what the scripture says. His strength is made perfect in what? I, and I wish it was the other way around. I wish that his strength was made perfect in our strength. Right? And, and we could be like, yeah, look at my strengths, everyone. And that makes, but what happens when we magnify our strength? He must increase and I must decrease. And God's strengths get manifested in our weakness. So if Paul even put it this way, therefore I will glory in my infirmity. I'm going to glory in my weakness because the more I, I promote my weakness, the more his strength is made manifest. Lastly, concerning others being more capable, the bottom line is God chose you. God called you. God has a task prepared for you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 puts it this way. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then it says, for we are his workmanship. Hey, workmanship. Uh, workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has what? Before ordained that we should walk in them. I like to do woodwork, and, and I, sometimes I've made different uh, desks or different shelves or different things, and I specifically made them for a specific purpose. Ahead of time, I was fashioning, I was planing, I was measuring, and, and God is doing that in your life. He saved you, not just to save you, but he saved you to do a specific task, a specific work. And you're not supposed to say, but God, wouldn't somebody else be more capable? No, he picked you. He chose us. He chose you for the work that he has for you to do. And he saved you that you might accomplish it. Doing a little series on the subject of encouragement. And uh, the first week we looked at being encouraged when we feel afraid. And certainly all of us have had seasons in life where we just felt fear uh, for one reason or another. Then last uh, week we looked at being encouraged when we feel alone. And